hello to uh, to to people who are here. Um, my name is Nicola Bridges. I'm one of the paediatric endocrinologists at Chelsea and Westminster. Um, I'm going to talk about short stature, um, and one of the things I'm going to talk about is growth hormone. Um, one of the sort of bits of research prior to starting is that if you type um, growth hormone into Google, you get 104 million hits, um, and that compares to um, testosterone, which is only 48 million hits, and thyroxin, which is only 4 million hits. Um, so growth hormones are very exciting and popular hormone. And I think one of the things I'm going to talk about is that a lot of the families who I see have already looked at one of those 104 million hits before they get to me. Um, there's no absolutely totally agreed definition for short stature height within the population is normally distributed. If you look at centile charts, weight isn't normally distributed. Um, and most children um, at the extreme end of, end of the range are completely normal children. They're just at the end of the range. However, um, referrals to hospital clinics with short stature are a very selected group of people. Um, for the purposes of defining idiopathic short stature, the FDA says that that is less than 2.25 SDSs, which is 0.4 centile. Um, and it's important to say that um, short stature is not a pathology, it's a physical characteristic. It's like having red hair. And so actually, you're not defining short stature as something being wrong with the child you're looking to see whether they actually do have anything wrong with them. And the clinical approach to being to short stature is, well, are they actually short? Is there anything wrong with them? Does, does this child have a pathology? And the final question, which we will end up discussing at length is, can you realistically do anything that will benefit the child? Um, and in terms of benefit, I would say that is, improving the child's quality of life now or preventing disease and improving the child's quality of life sort of later on. Um, first thing, are they actually short? Um, there's a number of studies which show, as you'd expect, that the further away from the normal range someone is, the more likely they are to have something wrong with them in terms of a growth problem. So someone who is actually on the lower centiles of the normal range is probably not very likely to have anything wrong with them. And the other issue we think about in defining whether they're actually short is that, of course, looking at parental heights, you can either calculate a, a mid-parental height um, or you can plot the parents' heights on the centile chart and adjust for, for the gender of the child. Um, pathology is more likely if a child is out of keeping with the parents and out of keeping with the family. However, rather obviously, that child who is short for the family is likely to be the one referred. So quite, quite a lot of children you see are those who are, yeah, the one who is short for their parents. Um, and people are staggeringly untruthful about their, um, their heights. Um, accurately measuring the parents can often resolve the situation about familial height. Um, it's been one of the issues during lockdown that we have not really been even able to see parents sometimes. So you can't assess whether they're telling you the truth when they say they're six foot. Um, a child who has completely normal growth pattern is not likely to have a pathology. And quite a number of the children we see are actually growing in a normal pattern, are in the normal range for height, and they are very, very unlikely to have an underlying growth issue. And that should temper what we do in terms of investigations. We shouldn't be doing lots of tests on children who actually aren't likely to have a problem. Um, and one of the things I signal up when I see people in clinic is if you follow growth over a reasonable period, so 18 months, maybe two years, and it's normal, that's the best way to check that things are okay. 
Um, and one of the things that has actually got easier with CERNA is that it's a really good idea to gather together any old growth data, plot it on the chart, because actually if you look back and the charts had measurements in other consultations and you can see a pattern of growth which is normal, you can be very reassuring even at the first consultation. Um, is there anything wrong with them? Well, history and examination. Um, sometimes the reason for the short stature is obvious from the medical history, um, even if the family or other people haven't quite looked at it like that. Meaning you see people who, for example, have had a really stormy neonatal period, they've had multiple surgeries, they've had periods on TPN, all sorts of things happen. And that has taken a hit out of their growth potential. At that point, um, people don't necessarily just make this up when things are resolved. So sometimes you can look back and say, I think this is why this child is short. On examination, are they dysmorphic? Are they disproportionate? And in older children, it's important to look at puberty, think about where they are in pubertal status, because that obviously has an influence on their growth. Um, what tests? Um, it's increasingly difficult not to do tests, but you don't necessarily need to. You know, when you see someone who's on a normal centile, who really, you know, you don't think actually has anything wrong, I don't think you need to necessarily pursue lots of investigations. Um, I do uh, thyroid function, celiac antibodies, and baseline bloods. Um, I'd also sometimes do IGF-1. IGF-1 and IGF-BP3 are markers of growth hormone status. Um, currently, um, we don't have IGF-BP3 available. And the rationale for that is that neither of those tests are wonderful markers of growth hormone status. Um, they're helpful if someone has a high, completely normal um, IGF-1, they're pretty unlikely to have growth hormone deficiency. Um, bone age is a way of looking at growth potential and um, it's not, you can't rate anyone under two. It's not actually very helpful under about four. Um, you can look at a bone age and you can predict adult height, but that adult height prediction isn't necessarily very accurate. And it also is only accurate if someone has a, a normal pattern of growth, meaning that, um, for example, if you've got Turner syndrome, it's not very accurate. If you've got precocious puberty, it's not very accurate. Um, I'm, sometimes, I'm extremely cautious about giving families height predictions um, because they can get locked onto, well, you know, is it going to be 171 centimeters or 169? And actually, Sometimes you just can't offer that accuracy. Um, I would the one test I'd always think about if a girl is really short is to do a karyotype. Not every girl with Turner syndrome has um, obvious clinical features of Turner syndrome, and some of them have absolutely no features of Turner syndrome. So um, it's worth considering that it's one of those things which still gets missed. You still see people who seen a variety of sort of healthcare professionals over the years who've noted the short stature um, and then you psychologically it's always very very difficult if someone's diagnosed um, as an older child or a teenager. Um, what else should you think about if you see a child who's short? Um, finding a new previously undiagnosed chronic disease in the endocrine clinic is rare. Um, think about it, it's not something, you know, I can only think of sort of a handful of times where that's happened. Um, most abnormal thyroid or celiac tests are actually incidental findings and not actually related to the short stature. Um, if someone is disproportionate or has some dysmorphic features, one of the things you should think about is the skeletal dysplasia, things like hyperchondroplasia. Um, Currently, the diagnostic approach is to do a skeletal survey, 
but we're moving more to genetic testing being available. So actually that's slightly to change and we'll probably move straight to doing genetic testing for skeletal dysplasias. And testing exists for things like Noonan syndrome, Silver Russell syndrome, and other syndromic sources, <coughs> causes of short stature. Um, the definition of normal growth is that um, after about two or three years of age, children enter onto a centile and then grow fast enough to keep up on the same centile. They very rarely move up and down significantly after that until they get to puberty. Prior to, in the first couple of years of life, prior to that, you can move up and down. So you see children who've gone all the way from the bottom to the top of the chart or from the top to the bottom and then set out on their centile. And that can sometimes you know, be a reason for referral. You know, they were born and they're on the 75th centile and now they're on the, the ninth. Um, growth velocity fluctuates over sort of weeks and over years. So you need to follow up for a long enough period to make sure it's normal and you need to look at a reasonable period of time for growth velocity. Um, so if you have a child who's growing steadily along their centile, they're likely to carry on doing that unless there's some kind of health event intervening. Um, it's quite unusual to move either upwards or downwards. And it's helpful to explain that to parents that they shouldn't expect their child who's on the 25th centile to suddenly move up to the, the 75th. It's not going to happen. And also to explain that, yes, they are going to probably stay on that centile, um, meaning that they'll end up as an adult probably roughly in that position. The cutoff values for growth hormone stimulation tests are worked out on the basis of looking at children who have normal growth patterns or abnormal growth patterns. So the definition of normal growth hormone secretion is actually having a normal growth pattern. So someone who's doing that has normal growth hormone secretion. Um, once you get to older children, um, the timing of puberty um, affects your growth. It doesn't affect your adult height, except in the extremes. So children who have extreme end precocious puberty or extreme end delay, it does affect it. But between about sort of six and a half, seven years of age and about 18, 19, puberty timing doesn't have a big impact. What does happen is obviously, it's mainly boys who have late puberty, they present having fallen behind everyone else because they haven't had their pubertal growth. Um, one of the other issues about pubertal growth is that there have been quite a lot of work on studies on looking at holding up puberty, um, meaning giving a gonadotrophin GnRH analog and halting puberty. Um, it's a kind of popular thing in some places to offer that. Actually, it doesn't have an impact on adult height. It's not a worthwhile exercise in terms of trying to increase people's height. It just slows down the growth for a while. Um, growth hormone stimulation testing um, is quite a labor intensive thing. Um, doing a glucagon test, takes a whole day and takes the attention of our endocrine nurse for a whole day. Children who should have growth hormone stimulation testing are those who have a documented reduced growth velocity who are falling off the centiles. Also that group who are so short, so far below the 0.4 centile that actually pathology seems very likely. Um, there are some high risk groups around who should be tested, you know, children who've had radiotherapy, surgery, um, children with other documented pituitary problems. Um, you should only do that test if you are actually going to treat with growth hormone, depending on the result, which kind of brings you on to children who have documented normal growth or 
within the normal range for height, they don't need a test just in case, which is one of the kind of conversations you have with families, um, because actually you wouldn't treat someone who was on the 25th centile. Um, so you're not going to do a test just in case. Um, in terms of genetics, currently we're not doing genetic testing very often on children with short stature, unless we have a, a target in terms of, you know, we think they've got Noonan syndrome. Um, more and more children are having genetic reviews, um, more of them are having arrays done, um, and gene panels are available for a range of things like early onset growth failure, Newman's, Silver Russell, also testing for quite a range of specific genes influencing pituitary development. Um, if you look at whole genome studies in the population, there have been quite a number which demonstrate a number, a range of genes, many of which are quite kind of expected, you know, like IGF and growth hormone, um, where genes have an influence on adult height. Um, looking at that currently is probably not terribly helpful in looking at short stature. Um, there are also any, a range of single gene abnormalities identified around things like IGF-1 and growth hormone and their receptors. Um, most individuals who have growth hormone deficiency don't actually have a growth hormone or IGF-1 abnormality. For the majority of those children who have an, a sort of genetic cause of their short stature, growth hormone is not likely to be going to help their, their adult height. Um, this is quite an old study, but um, it's a very complete study that was done in, in the UK. Um, the Wessex Growth Study started in the 1980s and they followed the children up to, I think, 11 or 12. Um, and it's one of the best kind of observation studies. They looked at every child who entered school in Wessex, which was 14,300 um, in those years, and measured them. Um, interestingly, they found that um, significantly less than 3% were less than the third centile. So it was one of the, one of the stimuluses to changing the growth chart. They found 190 children who were below the third centile for height, and 25 of those had already been picked up as having a condition. Some of them were already having treatment. They found seven children out of that 14,000 with a previously undiagnosed problem causing short stature. And actually, of course, not all of those were remediable. So actually only a handful of those children out of those 14,000 had kind of undiagnosed problems which should have been addressed. Um, maybe that's changed, um, but actually it's a very good representation of how, how frequent finding things is they demonstrated you're more likely to have an organic disease if you're a long way off normal. Um, they also looked um, at one of the other questions about short stature, which is around um, self-esteem and behavior. They found that actually socioeconomic status was the main predictor of reading ability and did not demonstrate that short stature had any effect on your self-esteem or your behavior or your IQ. Um, there have been a, quite a, obviously a lot of studies looking at that kind of question. Well, you know, are people with, are children with short stature disadvantaged and are adults with short stature disadvantaged and do they have reduced quality of life? Um, and it is by no means clear that what, you know, people tell you in clinic it is by no means the fact, the case, that, people, that either children or adults who are short have reduced quality of life or reduced life opportunities. Um, there are a lot of other factors which influence that, but it is not necessarily proven that height is one of them. 
one of the issues is that obviously if you go to a growth clinic and you line up people who've got their children referred, they will all say that their child's been disadvantaged because of their short stature. Um, can I realistically do anything that will benefit the child? Well, there are quite a limited list of things you can do. Obviously, if you pick up hypothyroidism, celiac disease, or some other chronic or nutritional condition, you should manage it, you should treat it. It's not actually in the context of children coming to a, a, an endocrine clinic, very likely that you will change their height. Um, one of the sort of slightly uncomfortable things is when you, I, I see, you see people who've, it's usually celiac disease, um, children who've been seen because of their short stature, someone's done some bloods, they've picked up celiac disease and that's been treated. Everyone's been very, very happy and said, oh, it's great, your child will grow, everything will be fixed. And like two years down the line, they haven't grown. And that was because the celiac disease was an inc incidental finding. Um, children who have significant pubertal delay sometimes benefit from sex steroid treatment, doesn't change their height at the end of the day, um, but can offer a, a psychological advantage. After going down that list, the only things you have left which might change height um, is growth hormone treatment and also very rarely recombinant IGF-1. Um, and the number of people who benefit is actually quite limited. Um, growth hormone's been around since the 1960s, recombinant growth hormone since the 1980s, and it was originally produced for people with growth hormone deficiency. Um, and here's an absolutely classic growth hormone deficiency. This is a boy who came to clinic because someone had noticed in a surgical clinic that he seemed a bit short for his family. Um, he had growth hormone deficiency on testing. He's treated, he has a, an acceleration and he then settles down to grow on a line in keeping with his family. And for him, you know, that's obviously a very worthwhile treatment. He's going to end up at completely normal height for his family, untreated, growth hormone deficient individuals. He'll probably, he would have ended up 135, 136 centimeters. So this is the main, you know, the, the, the best outcome of growth hormone treatment. Um, as soon as recombinant growth hormone became available, um, there were studies looking at a whole range of other short stature indications. Um, and currently in, um, e in the EU, the UK and under NICE guidance, there are a list of indications, um, growth hormone deficiency, also Turner syndrome, um, short stature in children who are IUGR and fail to catch up. Um, Prader-Willi syndrome, I see lots of children with Prader-Willi syndrome and for them there's one of the added advantages is around muscle strength and the ability to exercise which helps with weight control. And the final two indications are actually pretty small in terms of numbers. People with shocks mutations which is a skeletal dysplasia and people with um, chronic renal disease and short stature. Um, growth hormone is given as a daily injection through the growing period. So it's actually, you know, it's quite an undertaking. You know, if you have someone who starts on growth hormone at two or three, that's 12, 14 years of daily injections. Um, the benefit in terms of height is greatest for people with growth hormone deficiency and that's achieved with much smaller doses. The height increment in other indications is less and they need bigger doses. In Turner syndrome and IUGR it's about four to eight centimeters um, for much bigger doses. Um, there have been studies of the effect of growth hormone in quite a range of other short stature conditions. 
Um, and one of the things to say about, you know, growth hormone trials, which I've kind of been a, a helper on various trials, is that actually they're unbelievably expensive and they take a very long time. You know, if you're looking at final height, you're looking at growth hormone treatment over 10 years, 15 years. Also, one of the problems of, of a lot of the growth hormone studies has been that um, historically people have been unwilling to have control groups. So it's been very, you know, the interpretation is often based on height predictions rather than on actual comparison with a control group, which is different. And that has influenced some of the, um, some of the decisions of, of NICE and the um, European Medicines Agency. Um, there have been quite a lot of studies in idiopathic short stature and that's because the growth hormone companies have been very, very keen to have a license for idiopathic short stature. There is a license in the US, um, but not in Europe. And those are based on exactly the same studies, but based on a kind of different national, international idea of benefit. Meaning in Europe, the European Medicines Agency said that they didn't feel that the small increase you get in idiopathic short stature was worth having. I think I agree with that. While in the US, they said there's a small increment, people should be allowed to have a go. Um, in the US, there are quite strict prescription um, criteria for prescription based on height and expected height. Um, and the, the US Pediatric Endocrine Society has issued quite clear statements that they do not feel that um, growth hormone treatment is a kind of given that every child under the 0.4 percentile should have it. However, um, in the US and in quite a number of other countries, growth hormone is widely prescribed for people who don't meet the criteria, who may not be particularly short um, because people want it. In the UK, um, generally, um, people have kept more to nice guidance than some other places. Um, and in order to obtain funding, um, it's quite difficult to get funding for um, prescription outside of nice guidance. So that would be for people who are extremely short. Um, and in the UK, it is not the case that we can actually just write a prescription for someone whose parents would like growth hormone and they, you know, they don't fulfill any of the criteria. And also in the UK, um, generally, you can't go off to a private doctor and buy it. That's not the case elsewhere. Um, one of the big issues um, that kind of NICE has looked at, everyone's looked at, is that what's the benefit of treating from, with growth hormone? Growth hormone research has mainly looked at height and not often at the quality of life or well-being or long-term outcome of individuals. And it's important to say that a statistically significant increment in height doesn't actually translate to a benefit. Meaning, if you're a girl with Turner syndrome and without treatment, you would have been 143 centimeters. If actually you're 147 centimeters, how do you measure the benefit to that person? Are they really better off for that treatment? It's really a very difficult area, um, and it's an area which really hasn't been addressed very much. If you, you know, there have been a number of studies which have asked people on growth hormone treatment for various things. Are you happy? Well, actually, of course, they're all happy. They're having treatment. Whether that translates to their child having a benefit in the future is different. Um, and it's important to say there is no benefit and really very significant cost treating people where you're not going to change their height or you're only going to give a tiny increase in height. Um, growth hormone costs about £5,000 a year for an infant and then that will go up to sort of around 15,000 um, for a, an older child and a teenager and that's just for 
the medication. So you're adding on to that, you know, visits to hospital, blood tests, inconvenience to the family. So, you know, even with some of the licensed indications, the kind of financial cost of those centimeters is quite big. Um, so who should be treated? Children with growth hormone deficiency, there's no argument. Um, children with other licensed indications where giving them is going to give them a benefit. Um, and then there's a very small number of children where they're very short. It's clear there's an abnormality and there is an option with application to have a trial of growth hormone on an unlicensed basis. Um, for a lot of them, it doesn't make any difference, but um, obviously there is, an there is a, a situation where you would do that. Um, and who should not have short treatment? Well, this sounds obvious, but it's a discussion we have, I have in clinic very often. Normal children who are short for their family, who don't have anything wrong with them. Children who are not short for their family, whose family just want them to be a bit taller. Um, indications where growth hormone's not actually going to make a difference to their height. Um, and children who've stopped growing, which you'd be surprised to hear is quite a common discussion um, and also there are children where an increment in height is really realistically not going to make an indifference to their life you know children with cerebral palsy who are not going to ever be able to stand up or appreciate how tall they are are unlikely to benefit um, going back to money um, it's interesting to, to note you know growth hormone is a very big financial issue for the drug companies involved. Most growth hormone treatment is going to children. Um, there's a small market for adult growth hormone, and obviously there's an illegal market for weightlifters and athletes who abuse it. Um, looking up various market estimates, estimated in 2007, the global growth hormone market was um, $3,978 million. There was an estimate that that would increase by over to over $6,000 million by 2023. Um, half of the market is in the US. It's worth saying that that increase in market, all those millions, are not going to be you know targeting those children in Africa and rural India where their families are too poor to afford growth hormone so they're still not getting treatment. In the developed world it's actually quite unusual for children who have an indication for growth hormone not to get it. That increase in market is all going to be people in Asia, North and South America, some other places who are going to opt for growth hormone treatment for their children as a lifestyle choice, basically. Um, and that is actually quite a difficult thing. Um, it's something which is probably going to be happening inevitably. Um, and that is all about how people perceive their children. Um, there's a lot of psychology around height. Um, Families who ask for a referral for short stature are a very selected group. Um, we sometimes see people whose parents haven't even noticed their child short, someone else has, and they get sent up. Um, some families still want to have like a traditional sort of consultation where you check that their child's healthy, do some tests and tell them that it's all going to be okay. But actually, increasingly, we have people come who don't really want that and people who don't even really want me to do tests they don't want that kind of consultation they're really just coming to ask for the fix they want a prescription of growth hormone we have families who would expect to come up and have that on the first consultation um, which is obviously completely impossible if you look at children um, referred Yes, there's an excess of people who have social problems, psychological problems, medical issues, um, as you would expect. Um, and people 
having looked at one of those 104 million hits on Google, um, come with come prepared sometimes with a sort of range of strategies. Um, they'll the the partner who isn't in the appointment is always terrifically tall. Um, they'll always have tall brothers and sisters. Um, I've had families who will try and renegotiate the measurements, query whether we're doing them right, query the validity of the centile charts. Um, we've had, you know, families become angry. I've had families where every appointment was accompanied by tears or threats. You know, if, if this doesn't work out, you know, I'll come back to you. Um, for a lot of families, we just can't give them what they want. Um, and I've more and more tried to manage expectations right at the start to say what I'm going to do, to say I'm not going to be likely to be able to change the child's height. And I think one of the things that sometimes is an issue is that people come having, not having their sort of, their expectations discussed. Um, people can see the GP or see people and, and actually come expecting me to produce some, some magic when unfortunately I can't. Um, one of the, the sort of London things which has become, I think, more of an issue is um, children who come from abroad on growth hormone. Um, we get the occasional child who comes with, you know, well-documented, pathology, they come with a letter, they come with all their tests. That's relatively easy. Um, but actually more and more we get children who come um, having been started on growth hormone. Um, some of them have normal testing. Quite often we see people who've had no testing who've just been started. Um, and many of them not actually sh short. Um, there's quite a thing that we see children who go back home with the family over the summer holidays, see someone who starts the long growth hormone, they appear in clinic in September, October, having been sort of, they've bought a box of growth hormone um, with them. Occasionally we see people who've been started on sort of three or four times the standard dose of growth hormone. Um, which, although growth hormone is very safe, I, I think, you know, is actually quite a concern. Um, and certainly at Chelsea, and I don't think, it, I think everywhere else it's the same, we would always stop that treatment, always review the situation. We can't be in a situation where people buy six weeks of growth hormone in wherever and come, and, and then there's an expectation that we then carry on with unnecessary treatment for the next 10 years. Um, sometimes that causes some discussion. One of the, the things to say about, you know, children who are started on growth hormone is that sometimes families are, you realise that families have been pressurised into this. Um, you know, a lot of them have asked their paediatrician in the US or wherever for the growth hormone, but some of them, they've been put in a situation where they're told that, you know, you've got to do this. You've got to have the growth hormone, your child needs it. Um, and they're buying it. They're not, you know, a lot, most of these people, it's not, there's not a health service providing it. Um, one of the most extreme ones is, here's a very good growth chart. Um, this is a girl who came from abroad, um, had had two very well-documented, completely normal growth hormone stimulation tests multiple other blood tests, multiple bone ages, um, has not very tall parents, um, is clearly, as we would define, idiopathic short stature, except that she is in range for her family. Um, and they were told, you know, you've got to give this child growth hormone. And so um, started, came to see us. And even the mum, you know, the mum said, we agree, we couldn't see any perceptible change in this child's height and so she decided that she would stop. Um, some children with idiopathic short stature do get a small increase in growth velocity, 
studies say that there is a small increment in adult height, but not much. Um, but we actually get quite a number of people who have, have started on the basis of idiopathic short stature. So to summarize, most short children don't actually have anything wrong with them. You're, what we're doing is trying to sort out, make sure that they haven't got anything wrong with them, make sure they're growing normally. And if you assess their growth velocity and look at their growth chart over a reasonable period of time, you can be reassured that everything's fine. And actually one of the, one of the problems sometimes is discharging people. And actually you can say if someone's grown at a normal speed over a couple of years, you can discharge them. You can say, this is going to carry on okay. Um, we would normally do some blood tests to check that everything is okay. Um, and it's important that, to say that you know, growth hormone treatment is life-changing for some people, but it is only likely to help in a quite limited group of people. Thanks very much. And stop sharing. Nicola, thanks very much indeed. Um, I was going to type something in the chat box as a question for you, but I'll ask you face to face if I may. So, mm -hmm. what is Andy Bush? One of the things we sometimes see are children who have got a chronic disease, such as really bad bronchiectasis. They're on maximal medical therapy for the bronchiectasis, and they're not growing well because of this chronic burden of sepsis. And obviously the first thing to do is to treat the underlying condition as, as energetically as possible. Um, is there any role at all for any sort of growth stimulation or is it a complete waste of time? Uh, sadly, it's probably a complete waste of time. I mean, there have been studies looking in inflammatory bowel disease, um, which ha have shown a kind of limited effect. Um, and probably the problem is that it's all about inflammatory markers and that actually that is, it's a, that these people are actually probably making quite a lot of growth hormone. It's just not having an action and kind of adding a bit in is not necessarily going to help very much. Are there other, other, other questions for, Nic for Nicola? I mean, Broad, broad brush. <clears throat> who should we refer? Who should you obviously don't want to see every short, every short, ch short child whose parents are concerned about their growth, or more usually it's the in-laws who are concerned about their growth. Who should we actually be? Who, who should we actually be sending to you, Nicola, in practical terms? I mean, in practical terms, definitely anyone where it looks like or appears like their growth is falling off. Right. Um, people who are significantly short, definitely. I mean, I think, I think with the ones where they're worried, you know, we see an awful lot. And I think sometimes, sometimes having that one consult, you hope that having that kind of one medical process where you can say, this is fine, don't worry, it's gonna be all right, reduces them bouncing back between different medical practitioners and their GP, um, you kind of hope that you can resolve it. So sometimes it's worthwhile just to sort of have a consultation, say this is all right. Um, I but mean, I think that's, partly that's, because... Certainly that's right. Reassurance is always a good reason for making a referral to any, spe to any specialist. Um, there's, a, there's a question from, from Heidi. Heidi, all oh, right. Sorry, busy room, so I'll type. There is quite a big range for early delayed puberty. How long do we watch and wait before referral in both boys and girls, Nicola? Um, I mean, in, in boys, uh, most boys have I mean, almost completed puberty by 14. So someone who's kind of falling behind at... 13, 14 should definitely be referred. With girls, it's slightly earlier. Um, and so someone who, a girl who's 13 and not actually started puberty is, is quite late. Um, I guess we see some children who get referred earlier because they're very short. Um, I mean, in terms of early puberty, 
I think that's become a very difficult area because actually um, we get a lot of referrals of almost all, it's always, always girls um, with early puberty who are between sort of seven and a half, eight and a half with some development. Um, and there's often a lot of concern and a lot of concern about growth. And actually the, the sensible thing is not to do anything about most of this because actually it's normal puberty, but um, it's, it's become more of an issue. I think, I think it's another thing where parents are asking for referrals more often for early puberty. And we're possibly seeing less delayed puberty actually. Anybody got any other questions either to speak or, or type, into, type into the chat room for Nicola? Here's a golden opportunity to ask the question that you are not sure about. No. So it seems like, seems like not. Last all, oh wait, here we are. There's somebody saying great. Well, I completely well, agree. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Nicola, many thanks. I would remind people that Nicola's talk is going to be put on, is going to be put online. If you've got any difficulty uh, find, a accessing it, email me or email Nicola Grinstead, who has very kindly run this. Nicola Bridges, many thanks for a great talk, really helpful. And Nicola Grinstead, many thanks for running it. Next week, we're going to have somebody from outside the region. We're having Steve Cunningham um, from, from Edinburgh, who's going to be talking about bronchiolitis. And Steve has, has done some cutting edge international res research on that, on that. So please uh, rock up then. Please also, can, can we have feedback? If there are topics you want, this is for the trainees, this is for, this is, these are your sessions. Please let me know what topics you would like, if you'd like a different format, a different time. It's very difficult to find a time for everybody, but it will suit everybody, but we'll do our best. So many thanks all. I'll bring this session to a close. Uh, have a great day and speak soon. Many thanks. Thanks, Nicola.